we'll go ahead and get started. So good to see everybody here this morning. We may have a few more coming in, but we'll uh, get started. It's a couple minutes after 10. I do have a fair amount of material I want to get through. Um, before we get into that, let's go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, you've been good to us in so many ways, and we are grateful for everything we enjoy in this life. The opportunity we have to be here together this morning to study your word, to study the things of the world, and help us to uh, focus in on you and to believe in you and what you have uh, shared with us, and that we might be better prepared to be able to defend our faith, to help other people to, to see you in this creation. That all things, Father, we pray that your will is done and your name glorified. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So this morning I've, I've titled this as Hard Questions, uh, Room for Faith and Growth. And this is kind of a, a continuation of our discussion last week. Um, but I want to point the camera back towards us a little bit because we've been looking at evolution and looking at some of the questions that they struggle to answer. And at the same time, there's questions that we struggle to answer. And so I'm going to kind of look at a little bit of both this morning and then talk about it. So now what do we do with all this? Right. OK, so. So it's kind of a, a, a quick review and um, a, a, something that we can start off with, the, kind of the easy part. In, in Darwin's Origin of Species, he laid out four postulates um, for the origin of species. And when I look at these, I could say, hmm, I, I can probably go along with these. Basically says individuals within a species are variable. We see that every person is unique, right? Um, some of these variations are passed on to offspring. We see that in every generation, more offspring are produced than can survive. And if they don't, then the species begins to decline, goes extinct. Um, survivals are not random. The individuals survive and go on to reproduce or who reproduce the most are those the most favorable variations. They are naturally selected. So this is the idea of the survival of the fittest, that those that can actually survive the environment, they go on to reproduce and so forth. And I think most of us can say, yeah, I, I can go along with that. We see that, right? But what evolution does then is it takes this the next step and says that all variation between all species is all related to an initial single cell and all variation comes from that, um, which is where we say, hmm, that doesn't quite agree with what we see or what the Bible says, but we can start here as kind of a part, yeah, I can go along with these things, okay? But when we start looking at things, when we start, uh, people start talking about intelligent design or creation, and we look at people who believe in evolution, that they reject God as the creator. And I found this one fairly decent article. Um, it's actually hard to find good articles on either side because they tend to just want to criticize the people and not the positions or the science. So you have to kind of watch that. Um, but this article here was actually done, he did a pretty nice job of explaining from his position why he rejects intelligent design. But I want you to notice within this, um, I won't read the entire article, I have it here if anybody would like to read it. Um, but a couple of things, two, two key points that we have talked about and that he kind of refutes or says he doesn't agree with. One is the irreducible complexity. We looked at this one last week that in order to have like a functioning mousetrap, you have to have all the pieces there, take away any one piece, it doesn't work. And how do you get that with natural selection or evolution? And so it's that um, asserts that certain biological chemical systems contain parts that are too well matched to produce evolution. And then here's a couple of quotes from the article. It says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modification, my theory would absolutely break down. This is what Darwin put in his uh, Origin of Species, and we looked at that last week. And then the article says, yet no true examples of irreducible complexity have ever been found. The concept is rejected by the majority of the scientific community. And that is one of the difficulties to try and prove a negative. Can you prove Bigfoot does not exist, right? Say, so we don't have any good evidence, but can you prove it, right? He's out there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, he's got to be out there somewhere, yeah. And, and so that's the difficulty with some of these things, right? Um, and the article goes on and says, a necessary and often unstated flip side to this is that if an irreducibly complex system contains within it a smaller set of parts that could be used for some other function, then the system was never really irreducibly complex to begin with. What he is saying there and what evolution is trying to say is that if the parts and pieces, like for a mousetrap, if they already exist in 
separate places, could not evolution find a way to put those pieces together and make mousetrap? That, that's their position, okay? That's where they're coming from, okay? And so um, we look at, and so here's his, his last comment. A subset of the bacterial flagellum proteins, for example, are used by other bacteria to inject toxins into other cells and several of the proteins in the human blood clotting system are believed to be modified from proteins found in the digestive system, okay? So yes, there are um, bacteria that inject toxins that use a similar piece of the flagellum. And this is their argument, since that was out there, that evolution could take that piece, put it with this piece and make the flagellum. And they say they believe, right? So you can see there's faith on their end that they believe these things to be true, but they have not been able to demonstrate that it works. And then to follow that up, I found this um, article here, three new papers do nothing to undermine the design inference despite some of the research appeals to evolution. Instead, the papers add new details about the precision working of these machines unknown 15 years ago that accentuate the argument for design. And I've got the link to the article here that basically people are studying these things, they're finding, oh, our theory and explanation for evolution isn't working. It's actually becoming harder to use evolution to prove that, not easier. Um, but science is determined to go through, but at least they're looking, right? Um, but it, this is just a picture of, you know, kind of a diagram of what these flagellum looks like. I mean, they're very complex. They've got a rotor and a stator and they've got bushings and they've got a U-joint. I mean, it, it's a machine all within a single cell. And this thing can spin at like 100,000 RPMs. And how do you get that? I mean, all those pieces have to be functioning, you know, to make it work. I mean, it's, it's super complex. It's really kind of cool. Um, but this is one of the things that's irreducibly complex. And how do you do this, right? So, so they say they believe it's come from other systems, okay? Um, then another one, and this is from the same article now, is the idea of what's called specified com complexity, right? Um, and here they recognize that we recognize that some things are complex and they're also very specific, right? If you write some letters on the board, letters can be specific, but they don't really say much. And, and I have to put them in a certain order to make a word. And if we want to write like um, Shakespeare's sonnet, I have to have a whole bunch of words in the right order, right, to make meaning out of it. And this is the idea that they're specified and it's complex, Right, I can throw alphabet soup on the table and have a bunch of letters, but how often is he actually going to spell out words or even spell out a sentence? Right, that's the idea here. And so they recognize these. This also comes from the same article. The human genome is made up of some three billion DNA base pairs that contains about twenty-five thousand genes. DNA is obviously complex. The fact that humans always give birth to humans and not chimpanzees or naked mole rats shows that DNA is also specific. So they, they recognize this. It's specific and it's very complex, right? Um, in 1975, Japanese scientists reported the discovery of bacteria that could break down nylon, the material used to make pantyhose and parachutes. Bacteria are known to ingest all sorts of things, everything from crude oil to sulfur. So the discovery of one that could eat nylon would not have been very remarkable if it had not been for one small detail. Nylon, synthetic. It's not a natural material out there. It didn't exist anywhere in nature until 1935 when DuPont scientists, chemical scientists invented it. So how in the world does bacteria break it down? That's kind of their question and kind of their point, okay? So where and when did this bacteria get the ability to do, do this? Anybody wanna? Even hazard a guess? Oh, we just decided to take a bite of it and liked it. And decided to <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, who's to say that the, some prior process is already built into the bacteria? You know, it can dissolve other things. It can, you know, some of the things that the bacteria can eat are pretty, pretty baffling, really. And so it doesn't. It's not too far to say that because it breaks down this, it all so happens to break down nylon. Yeah. Know? And it just tried. Yeah. You know, right. And it works. Right. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. And what is what is nylon consisted of? Well, it basically is kind of it is made as an organic chemistry, right? So it's made up of polymers that do occur in nature, but we've rearranged it in a way that doesn't occur naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Is it a, so, it's a oil based product, isn't it? I think so. I mean, and then yeah. there's, you know, there's certain around things around that break down oil. I recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, we recognize that bright bacteria are great at breaking down all sorts of things. Uh, pretty amazing, actually. So the so the article goes on to say there are three possibilities. One, the nylon they actually called this gene the nylonase gene, named after nylon. Okay, they found this. Okay, so one, it was present in bacteria all along. Two, uh, this uh, uh, CSI. This is the complex um, uh, that word there. A complex specificity uh, for nylonase was inserted in the bacteria by a supreme being. Or number three, the ability to digest nylon arose spontaneously as a result of mutation because it allowed the bacteria to take advantage of a new resource, the ability stuck and was eventually passed on to future generations. So of those three, which one do you think that evolutionists support? Yes. Three. Number three, yeah, okay. Yes, okay. So this is what they write in the article. Apart from being from simply being the most reasonable explanation, there are two other reasons that most scientists prefer the last one, which is an example of Darwinian natural selection. The first, hauling around a nylonized, nylonase gene before the invention of nylon is at best useless for bacteria. At worst, it could be harmful or lethal. Secondly, the nylonase enzyme is less efficient than the precursor protein it's believed to have developed from. Thus, if nylonase really was designed by a supreme being, it wasn't done very intelligently. So they're saying that, that yeah. bacteria only eats nylon. No. So no. it could eat other things. It could eat other things, so, yes. So, you know, just because it eats nylon doesn't mean it can't eat other things and survive Correct. for that. Right. It was obviously eating other things prior to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this is again where they use the word believed, right? They don't have any direct observation of these things, but this is the way they believe it happened, okay? Um, and, I, and I did a little bit more poking into that too, and it appears that there was a, a protein that actually, as you say, they basically kind of tried and like it, it actually was able to partially break it down. And there may have been a mutation to an existing gene that allowed it to be more effective in breaking it down. You know? So basically it appears that number one is most likely it was there already. That there was something already there um, to allow it to do that and just got better at it. Okay. Is bacteria be great at landfills, you think? It is. Okay. Yeah, we use bacteria for a lot of things for you know um, cleaning up oil spills. Um, we use it for breaking down a lot of chemicals. Um, I teach a class on terrestrial restoration, and one of the things we look at is the fact that we use a lot of bacteria in connection with trees to kind of clean up a lot of our organic and uh, inorganic spills and stuff. They're very good at breaking down a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So you want to like, you know, put some hand sanitizer on your parachute, you know, before you, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, it probably has to be in the right condition. Probably has to, you know, if you keep your parachute dry, it's probably not going to decompose it, right? If you get it wet and stuff and you've got bacteria present. Yeah. Because a lot of these things need the right conditions to work. Keep Do your you know when they found out that it did eat? Um, I think this was in, um, let's see, 1975. So 40 years, 40 years. that thing mutated when evolution is supposed to take yeah. millions of years. Yeah. I mean, why, why do they think that would mutate so fastly compared to every other yeah. argument would be over time? Yeah, well, bacteria can, can reproduce rapidly. I mean, they can make several generations within a day's time, right? right? But every other evolution theory is billions of years to, yeah. to make it. Yeah. Well, supposedly then evolution, you know, bacteria is a single cell animal. Supposedly we get from bacteria, we get to multi-cell, but why doesn't bacteria continue to mutate into multi-cell animals and so forth? It just seems like it only happened once. So these are the kinds of questions that we have that we struggle, that they struggle to answer, okay? But they obviously believe in these things, okay? So um, that's just a couple of examples. Um, I've got, let's see, how are we doing for time? I've got one other one. Oh, I've got a couple of chats here too. Okay, yep, from Paul. Thank you and Sean. All right, good morning. All right. Um, I have one other here. Just, I want to go through just really quickly. This is one that I have shared with my students and I've highlighted some things I didn't highlight with them, um, but I just want to point out um, some of the same kind of thing. This is the evolution of hibernation in mammals. Um, and basically there are many theories about the evolution of hibernation. None have ordin extraordinary evidence supporting them. 
we're going to explore theories, okay? Um, it happens in mammals, birds, insect, reptiles, um, physiologically what happens genetically, okay? Um, they actually have found certain genes that seem to be important for this, that they can actually break down which genes control aspects of hiber hibernation. And they get into the theories. Um, they found this particular gene that's highly conserved in many mammals. And so maybe that's part of the reason. Um, genes that are highly conserved may be selected for, okay? Um, many believe hibernation has evolved from early endotherms. These are warm-blooded animals. Um, and then they have the, the mechanisms and the patterns that they see out there, okay? And then some believe hibernation and topar evolved separately on different mammals and in birds. Um, and they actually go through looking at related forms of birds and mammals and which ones actually have this characteristic and trying to see maybe there's a connection. Okay. Um, many believe hibernation has evolved from a common ancestor. It's only evolved once. Okay. And they have some evidence. Some ancestral mammals are thought to be heterothermic, meaning they could be both cold or warm blooded. Um, so they're looking at this um, size and diet hypothesis. Possibly all early animals were small and went through some sort of hibernation. Okay. So uh, how does this affect the evolution of hibernation? Theory of evolution, hibernation is still debated over. Research to believe it is not one evolutionary process acting on mammals, but it's evolved in several small steps over many generations. I, I go through that. What you can see is they don't know. They, they have some pieces of evidence, but nothing fits together well, right? And this is anytime you dig into the scientific literature, on this topic, every time you get down to kind of this level, this is what you run into, is they, they believe, they think it's possibly maybe, they don't have any specific examples that can show it exactly happened the way they think. Yeah, so that's, I just wanna point that out, okay? All right, we'll go back to our other presentation here. Okay, so we looked at that. So when we look at the scientific method, um, this is important both for us and for other people we talk to. It says, in order to be valid, a scientific theory must unite a broad range of observations, inferences, and facts under a detailed explanation, which makes predictions about the outcome of future experiments and observations. This is important, right? If you try and come up with a theory to explain things, then you need to have a way of testing it. Uh, Einstein did this with his um, special relativity. He said that gravity would actually bend light and scientists waited for an opportunity when there was going to be a, an eclipse that they could observe starlight being bent around the sun. They could test it, right? And so good scientific theories does this. All theories have gaps which invite further investigation and testing. And through this process, some theories are discarded, others are strengthened. But when a well-supported theory falls by the wayside, it's almost always because an alternative has been proposed, which accounts for more facts and makes better predictions. For example, the replacement of Newtonian physics with Einstein's theory of relativity. So we've seen that in the scientific world. And so the point that's being tried to be made here is that if God is the creator and creation is the explanation, that we need to be able to present it in a way that can be tested from a scientific method, and it does a better job of explaining more facts, okay, than evolution, okay? That's kind of the job, okay? So our job is actually harder than it looks, right? We can look at the other side and say, well, it doesn't add up, you, you can't prove it, but they can look at us and make the same kind of claim. That's what I wanna look at a little bit more today is what's our job in this, right? To present a testable process for irreducible complexity or specify complex, complexity that demonstrates evolution cannot be the cause, right? How do you design an experiment to try and prove those things? That's a challenge. And that's a hard thing for us to do. But these are the kind of things that the scientists from the evolutionist time are looking for. If we want to answer them in a way, we need to come up with a way to do this. And we also have some questions that are really hard for us to answer. Right? We've already looked at evolutions have trouble finding sufficient evidence for their claims. Uh, but as believers in God's creation, there's some challenging things for us. And to be honest, 
um, and objective, we need to look at all the evidence and all the questions. And so what I want to present now are some questions that evolution has posed to us that we struggle to answer, right? And this isn't to cast any doubt in our faith, but just to recognize that we have a challenge as well to try and answer these people, okay? So here's the first one. How did the fossil record come to be stratified as it is? When we look at fossils in the rec rocks and so forth, there appears to be a very distinct type of stratification, which seems to line up with what evolutionists claim is the complexity going from low complexity to high complexity, or from simple forms to more complex forms. Um, for instance, we have primarily invertebrates at the bottom. Then we have you know, more complex things like fish, then amphibians, then reptiles next. And typically we find mammals and birds on top of the pile, right? If they were all created at the same time, why do they show up in the fossil records at different levels? It's a good question, right? Yeah, okay, Trent? I didn't know if you were looking for an answer to that question. Well, yes, yeah, I, we'll try to talk about a couple of explanations, but yes, we are trying to, because it's a, it's a valid question. I mean, you go out and look at the rocks and you can see them, and how to get that way, right? Yeah. So, so I think that there are many, many examples that break that. There okay. are many. They had, I mean, they found, I mean, a lot of times I feel like sometimes they, uh, a lot of the scientific journals and stuff, they'll post things that are, you know, they have, you know, they have their goggles they look through, right? And so when they see something that breaks it, they explain it away. Like there's lots of examples of, I mean, things that, you know, uh, you know, trees that go through strata layers mm -hmm. that are supposedly, you know, millions of years apart, right? Mm -hmm. And there's lots of examples of things like that shouldn't be in places that they shouldn't be, you know, that break that, yes. you know? And so when they find those things, they'll explain it away or whatever. Or, and so I think it's a bit misconstrued by a lot of the, the scientific community that's one yeah explanation. so so part of it is that there are exceptions to yes. the general yeah. rule and there's a good say, amount of exceptions yeah and so that's that's part of it okay Keith? i mean, found marine fossils on top of mountain range yes yeah and so and uh, how there, do we explain that there's that yeah. other place where uh on the biloxi riverbed they found dinosaur tracks and human tracks crossing each other yeah so that kind of messed up the phylogenetic tree yeah, that there is, I mean, there's evidence that, you know, humans and dinosaurs coexist. I mean, like say there's a, you know, a human footprint on top of a dinosaur footprint, or if you look at like cave paintings and they paint a, you know, a pretty good picture of a stegosaurus, well, how do they know what it looked like? Or how come many cultures have, you know, uh, uh, legends about dragons, which basically would be a large reptile. where did those things come from, right? Chris, you want to say something? Well, uh, like the turns point, you have, you have the fossils that are go through multiple strata and for the whole thing to be fossilized and go through all these hoops just doesn't make any sense. And, and looking at your thing, it kind of supports the flood theory. The heavy things float to the bottom and the wider things float to the top. Yeah, that, this, is, this is one of the, the arguments that we do make. And it's one that scientists look at and say that doesn't fully explain it. Okay. Now, is yeah. this the same, like, is this digging in the same exact spot? Like, no, this, this is, is basically they, digging in yeah. many different spots. So they're basing the it on like carbon dating then? Or what yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's a whole other whole set of things we start thinking <laughs> about the age of the rocks and the fossil and stuff. It almost becomes somewhat circular. So um, at yeah. a certain level, how do we know it's at the time, same yeah. time frame? So we don't, and, and basically um, their argument is that these aren't on the same time frame. that these, what we see in here are actually in different time frames. These might be 500 million years old, these might be 300, and these might be 100 million years old. So how are they dating that? How right, they, so- Are they able to be at the same time? Yeah, you so know, radiocarbon uh, dating and some other methods. So it's, it, it's a tricky one for them and for us to try and answer fully, right? We weren't, none of us were there right when these things were formed and so trying to go back and put it together you know but this when we go around the world and we look in general when you look at the fossil record you see these layers and you see more or less this distribution and how it got there right Tyler? so do they find like human fossils on the top layer with the mammals generally yes okay. we find those at the very top yeah right 
it is is uh, what they'll, they'll use this for their side as well but i mean you have this way those kinds of fossils you find on the bottom are going to be easy to things to fossilize the things that have hard exoskeletons hard shells on the outside that aren't going to be you know they're not going to decay when they're left out right so you're going to find those a lot more than you're going to find anything else but they'll use that you know that can go for their side as well because yeah. they're like okay well these have been around for some yes. years so obviously yeah. you're going to find them everywhere but i mean it kind of supports what we think as well right the yeah. things that are more closer to the top are going to things that haven't been there as long right and you know the more that we dig into the process of fossilization the more we're finding out it's pretty hard to make a fossil it's pretty hard to make something yeah. stay for even you know yeah a thousand years much right. less you know and so it makes sense that the things that are closer to the top AKA they're younger, right? Are gonna be the things that are harder to keep as a muscle. Yeah. Yeah, but these are some of the things that we've looked at that, um, you know, things that are denser tend to fall down, things are lighter, but you see within the column, you see examples that are the other way around as well. So it, you're right. Some of this can go both ways. Yeah, exactly. Chris, you're gonna say that? But when you uh, look at uh, Brad's hair uh, video about, uh, Mount St. Helens. Yeah. And uh, he shows that processes that, according to scientists, took millions of years have essentially occurred around Mount St. Helens within a very few years. And it's the length of time is defined. Yeah, see, Mount St. Helens is a really good example, and, and I take my students down there on a field trip, and you can go through there and you can see places where you've got like 150 to 300 feet of deposits, and in some of those you can actually see distinct layers, you know, that it'll actually form these layers. What would be interesting would be to see, because we know we have all the different kinds of animals out there, is to see at some point, can you find if these animals were buried, are they buried in a sequence like this or not? that would be a type of way to say, okay, this can work, right, or not. Or if we went to Mount St. Helens, we started digging in there, knowing the actual history we were there and finding that all these different um, types of animals are all mixed together, then we'd say, hmm, that would lend more credence to the evolution. But if we find a, a distribution more like this, say it would lend more to, the, to a flooding type event because it was a massive flooding event. Um, so this is something that I don't think anybody's ever tried to go through and do that, that study down there. So I, I you know, honestly, at first, I don't think the scientific community will ever find out specifically how it happened because right. uh, there, it's, they, they will never, like science is based around fact, right? Something you can see, and yes. whatever. And, uh, when it's like, you know, they'll never base science off of faith and nobody was around when God created the earth. Correct. So it's, you know, I feel like they're going to be searching forever because they can't base it off of faith. Yeah. Well, as we've seen, they believe in a lot of their stuff, right? So there is a faith there. Yeah. And we, we believe in God. So a lot of this kind of evidence can be, you know, interpreted either way. Right. And that's, that's one of the challenges. Okay. Keith. There's a place in the old Testament that says the secret things belong to God. Yeah but the things which are revealed belong to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I see the potential here that, you know, God has some secret things going here that yeah. neither side's going to know because he kept them secret. Yeah. And, but in, I think it's first Peter or is it second Peter where it says that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Yeah. yeah. So we got enough to, to get us to heaven. We do. We have enough to know to get us to heaven. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. And there are things that God has not revealed to us. Um, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't really give us a lot of detail. Here it is. You know, uh, He said he made them after their own kind and reproduced. Uh, but a lot of these details we don't have. And so I think you're right. I think we'll never fully get a, a satisfactory answer for either side totally on this question. Yeah. Okay. But a couple of things. We've kind of talked about this. One that we've come up with is hydraulic sorting. That water tends to sort things out. Dense stuff falls down. Light stuff flows to the top but it's not consistent either in the fossil record or um, victim habitat mobility. Water habitats be the first to be affected, right? Fish and mollusks, lowland areas nest with slower moving animals like amphibians and reptiles, small mammals, and then larger, more mammal, more mobile animals, humans and big animals, they'd move out of the way of the flood and would end up on top, which 
makes some sense. But again, it's not 100% consistent. Just like we find exceptions to their side, they find exceptions to our side. So again, the evidence can be pointed, but it's how you interpret it, yeah. So these are questions that are um, difficult, okay? Um, also, why is there not a layer of flood deposition to be found in a uniform layer over the whole planet? Uh, why is there not a uniform flood layer pointing to global flood? It's not, it's not these deposits aren't uniform. But part of it, too, it looks like that the land masses have all shifted and stuff. So this is part of it. But these are the type of questions, okay? The, other, the next question I'm going to have is one that I, I had not even thought much about until I was researching this, and I don't have a really good answer for it, but they make a really good point. Um, this has to do with Noah's Ark and disease. For numerous communicable diseases, the only known reservoir is man. That is the germs or virus which cause the disease can only survive in living human bodies or well-equipped laboratories. Well-known examples include measles, pneumococcal uh, pneumonia, leprosy, typhus, typhoid fever, smallpox, uh, polymyelitis, syphilis, and gonorrhea. Was it Adam or Eve who created, was created with gonorrhea or syphilis? Um, the scientific creation insists on a completed creation where the creator worked but six days have been resting ever since. Thus, between them, Adam and Eve, had to have been created with every one of these diseases. Later, somebody must have carried them on the ark. Where do all these diseases come from? How does that fit into our understanding of God's creation? I think of Psalms 91 okay. or another place where God said, I will put upon them none of these diseases. It's possible that God could have introduced those post-flood. Okay. You know, as a way to punish some disobedient nation. Okay. Yeah, and I, oh, Tyler, go ahead. Well, don't, I mean, I've heard this before. I don't necessarily know um, where most people get it, but, you know, when they say Adam and Eve were created, um, they say, that, you know, that they were perfect. There's no corruption and, and, you know, disease and, and things like that. And that didn't come until after the fall. And so most people will say, you know, that's why you even see them living a lot longer than people now. And so is it plausible to say that like these things didn't even exist in the beginning for like a thousand years? That's plausible perhaps, but then where did God do another bit of creation creating these diseases afterwards? If we say he was all done, see, that's the point they're making. If we claim that God was done in six days, but then he came back in a thousand years or after the fall and came back and created these, are we not, not therefore contradicting ourselves? I mean, why couldn't he just protected them from it because there was no sin yeah. until they right. sinned? And like how, how, did that, how did those disease organs survive if they have to be in humans? Because I just, so, I yeah. just, in my mind, I just called myself a hypocrite because yeah. what I just did when you read this is I was thinking, well, bacteria and, and viral, they mutate. Yes. And then I'm thinking about, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. Like, what you, what, because we're, that's what we're taught. Right. I, mean, I don't, is that true or not? I mean, but that's what I was thinking. And yeah. And I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Know. See, and that, exactly. I mean, that's why we want to kind of point the camera back to make sure we're not doing the same thing we're accusing the other side of doing, right? Because we can be, right? We can be guilty of being biased and being hypocritical. So we got to think about these things ourselves in a, trying to be objective about them, right? And so, you know, we can come up with these and, and making sure, okay, does this fit? You know, yeah, it's, they would evolve and like, well, whoa, Derek, what's going on? Well, yeah, <laughs> but, but we've, we've actually, we've made the point already, even today, that like the one that East Nylon, that it made, there was some mutation that made it better adapted. It was there, but better adapted. And we, and we see that even within just, just look at um, COVID right now. We've recognized different variants, right? There's a mutation that gives a slightly different ability to be um, passed on and or to cause sickness, right? So we recognize, but it's still a bacteria, right? So what causes it to mutate? Um, yeah, different things with, I mean, there are different ways in which genes that are copied that there can be mistakes made. Sometimes radiation can definitely affect it. We've, we've seen that very clearly. Um, but we've recognized for long periods of time that mutations kind of random mutate, but the vast majority of them are harmful or at least they're not helpful. But every once in a while, you might get one, and, and COVID's a good example, where you get a mutation that might make it more communicable, but it also makes it less virulent, right? So the bacteria 
bacteria, so, or the virus or the bacteria, we'd be thinking of as cells, right? That'd yes, they're cells. So right now, our body has lots of cells. Now, could those mutate as well and cause evolution? Yeah, so that's the point. That's what they try and claim, that it can cause evolution, that we can get all the variation we see by these accumulation of these mutations. But what they've never been able to show, and what I've tried to show, is that we can't get from one kind, which the Bible says we created in different kinds, can't get from one kind to another kind. So you're not going to get from bacteria to virus, or virus to bacteria. You're not going to get from bacteria to sponge. You're not going to get from sponge to jellyfish. I mean, because I guess I haven't really done much research on like Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. So can, does the Bible say anything about that? Neanderthals to where we're at now? It doesn't really address that well yeah and the evolution of man the scientists themselves are they can't even piece it together and it's supposed to be same kind yeah. right right same, same kind yeah. yeah but we recognize within a kind within a species that there is variation and there are mutations right um i think we mentioned last week like sickle cell anemia which is caused by a mutation to red blood for red blood cells and so it's been known for some time that this mutation and it pops up frequently. I and mean, we have a lot of genetic diseases that are the result of mutations that seem to occur more or less regularly in our genome, right? And cause known conditions. And they're almost always bad for us, right? But sickle cell seems to also confer some ability to be able to protect the people from malaria. So there's some advantage to it, even though there's a disadvantage. So it seems to persist in the genome, right? Um, so we see these kind of things. So getting back to this question, I can see, you know, perhaps, you know, these elements have been out there, but after the fall or after the flood, that God allowed these things to morph in such a way they become more virulent than they were in the past. But again, we're using the same kind of logic that they are, right? When they say we believe that the, these um, different pieces came together to make flagellum, we're saying the same thing, essentially. Right, which makes it a challenge, right? Yes. I mean, we're saying it with a bit of an advantage, right? That there's an intelligent creator. Exactly. You know, this guiding of, the process right, rather exactly. than yes. your raw right. science and yeah. raw chance. Right. We're saying it from that perspective, but we're not, it, it's, it doesn't have any more weight with them. No, it doesn't. Than their that. argument has with us. For sure. That's the point, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So these are things that we need to um, think about. Um, some other questions. Um, what did the predators eat when they got off the ark? Good question. Yeah. Or how did the plants survive the flood? They didn't bring any plants in them. Did they also, and maybe the seeds survived that, you know? Okay. Yeah. Or how did the animals make their way to all the different parts of the earth after the flood? You know, there were big gaps and stuff. How did they get there? I mean, it's a long way to walk all the way around the earth from one location. Yeah. And we, we, we spread out, right? Um, yeah. Um, can we explain all the coal, oil, and gas deposits by the flood in terms of volume, depth, and formation? Or maybe God put them there at the beginning and left them there for us to, to find and make it think that it was take millions of years. I don't know. Because when you think about where coal, oil, and gas are found, sometimes they're found miles deep. Did the flood cause miles of deposition? And is it then, was there enough material, organic material present at the flood to account for all that volume. The timeline of when the flood happened, how many years from now? Um, yeah, I don't remember the exact. Um, I want to say it was, gosh, I don't know if I've got that. But basically, it was, I mean, it rained for 40 days. And I want to say over the period of, was it 150 days before they came out of the ark? Mm -hmm. I think it was. So it was, you know, roughly a half a year uh, for the flood um, timing. And the timing in terms of history, um, Let's see, would have been probably in about, I want to know this doesn't get it back there. I want to say, uh, must have been around 5,000 years ago, give or take, if we use biblical chronology. We took the average amount yeah. of soil that's been accumulated over a certain amount of time, and we can kind of make an educated guess on whether or not that oil or stuff has been there from the flood, or maybe yeah. put it there. Or Yeah, these are the type of things, yeah. Um, and there's other arguments, too, about you find different places where you can see where there's been deposits and layers that appear to be, you know, from uh, over a course of a year, just like tree rings. You can see them from year to year. And there's layers of sediment in, in lake body. They seem to peer, um, pile up. And how do we explain that from a flood uh, perspective? 
um, you know, if there's, there's, there's questions like this that we struggle with, right? So it doesn't mean we'll ever find an answer or that God couldn't have done it, but some things we struggle. Tyler? Well, I know at least for the, the first question, what did the predators eat that um, they took seven of each unclean or clean animal. And so they only needed each other to reproduce, right? And so, I mean, who's to say that they didn't feed some of the animals to the carnivores? Yeah, they got to survive long enough to have offspring. Yeah. So yeah, there's a number of these kind of things that, you know, that we could explore and there probably are some reasonable explanations, but again, these are questions that are asked of us, you know, so yeah. Um, yeah. I think it might be a little humorous, but when we get to heaven and maybe we could ask the Lord Jesus and say, how did you do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because we don't have all the answers, and I and I think yeah. disclosure agreement though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, but I think too part of it. I mean, God, God revealed to us what He wanted us to know, right? So some of these things we may never know, but again, we talk with people. This is a topic that comes up, and we have to deal with it. Okay, so um, to kind of summarize this, we got a couple minutes left. Both sides have difficult questions to answer, none of which are easy or totally satisfactory to everyone, right? Um, and they don't necessarily constitute proof at this point, right? So let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be gracious with those who disagree with us as we would like them to be with us, right? Treat people the way you want them to treat you, right? Don't go around, you know, calling them bad names and putting them all down and stereotyping them because we don't like that done to us, we right? Behind <laughs> yeah, <laughs> behind closed doors, yeah, um, yeah. Um, the other verse too that um, I actually found this on a website um, called Biologus, um, is found in Colossians chapter four, verse six, where it says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. In other words, be gracious with people, right? And this website, actually, that that's kind of their whole thing. They, they try and engage in these kind of discussions, but they want people to be civil, Right. If you start attacking people and say, if you're promoting your own agenda and won't even, you know, think about the other side, we don't want you. We want, we want honest discourse, kind of like we're having here, that they're willing to do that. Now I've come to find out that website, they actually believe in what we call theistic evolution. They believe God created it, but he also created evolution. It's been a long time frame. So they kind of try and marry the two together. And there's people that do that because both sides struggle to try and come up with those sets. So they try and put them together, but that has its own set of problems. But at least they're trying to be honest and trying to, you know, have a kind of discourse that's civil, right, which I can appreciate, okay? All right. Um, so one of the last things I want to mention here is that our faith does not rest solely on the, creation, the question of creation alone, right? If it based only on creation, we'd have a lot of doubts, right? But looking at the combined evidence of all the apologetics we have looked at. We've looked at archaeology, we've looked at history, we looked at a number of other physical sciences. Um, we can Next week, if you want, we can look at prophecy. All these other things point to this, uh, there's a God and he wrote the Bible. Okay, Tyler? Well, so, and I think that that's a great point, right? Because Paul said that if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then your faith yes. is useless. And so what we should be doing is you know, this is a great thing to study and to, uh, you know, have discourse over with people who are non-believers, but we should be saying, if you can prove to me that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then that's where we're going to start. Yeah, yeah, because the key to all of Christianity is Christ rising from the dead, right? Without that and the rest of this, yeah, who cares? Yeah. I think this, what we've been discussing does have a resolution to it, like we can't, you know, some say, well, we can't do such and such because there's no conclusion what there is. Romans 1 and 2, it calls men to be accountable because it says they can tell that God exists by what he has made. Mm -hmm. So they're without excuse. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's where we are. We know that we're, we're yeah. on the right side because they're without excuse. Yeah. Yeah, the Bible in a couple places makes that case, Romans chapter 1 and 2, and also in Psalm chapter 19, we've looked at that God's, his handiwork is evident, and people have chosen, you know, and they don't even want to consider that as an option, right? And, and part of our job, it's not easy for us from a purely a scientific standpoint 
It's not easy for us to try and convince them, which is why I think what part of Tyler's point, part of the point here is there are other lines of evidence that can demonstrate that there is a God, that he wrote the Bible and his word is true, okay? But this is a place where a lot of people that they go. And so I just, I think it's been worthwhile discussions for us, but it can't be the sole source of how we try and get people to know about God, okay? All right. So final question, we're kind of out of time. How we deal or approach people who don't agree as created the universe, right? So, all right. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be missed. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we know that, in fact, you are God. You have created this world. And we've seen that in so many ways. We recognize there are many people here who do not understand and believe that. But, Father, we pray that our faith would be strong. It'd help us to find ways that we can uh, love these people, uh, be gracious with them as you have been to us and all people, and that together we might be able to, to show that your word is true and that we might encourage and build one another up until we can spend eternity with you. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone.